My husband and I have been at Bryan College since 2003. He's been the president, and we have three children. Our oldest and our youngest live in Miami, Florida area, and our middle child's the one who came to Bryan and married a Bryan student, and she's the one who has our two grandsons. So uh, the, the uh, opportunity to uh, write a book about Bryan was really neat. It's kind of evolved over the 17 years that we've been at Bryan. Well, the story, the seed for the idea, really happened uh, during the first five years we were here. There was an alumnus couple in the Grand Rapids area that we would visit, and one of the things they kind of kept promoting and kind of dropping the idea into my husband's ear was, you know, we, we think that the Bryan community in general kind of has a narrow view of Mr. Bryan just based on his time in Dayton, Tennessee. And he was really a phenomenal man who lived a phenomenal life, and we think about ways we can get that out to people more in a more efficient way. That resulted in my husband asking the editor of Bryan Life, which is the alumni magazine, to do a series of articles about Bryan, all of which would cover topics that were non-scopes related. So that resulted in a series of 18 articles that ran from 2000, uh, I think the first one started in 08, and the last one was in 2013. And after that series was completed, I had the idea of compiling them into a booklet that we could give to new students as a way to acquaint them with Mr. Bryan when they came on our campus. Well, that idea failed. I tried to get it to gel, and it just never came together. So I kind of dropped it. However, the idea of being more effective at communicating Mr. Bryan's life story just kept nagging at me. So I picked up my uh, idea cap again, started thinking about uh, ways we could maybe start a book from scratch, and that's how it happened. So about three years ago is when I really got serious about researching. It took me about 18 months to come up with a 20 chapter blueprint, if you will, of how to tell his story. And then 18 months ago, I got with Curtis Jolly, who's our graphic designer, and we talked about ways we could present this story in a, in a visually appealing way that students would enjoy learning his life story. So he and I worked together for the past 18 months, and. A few weeks ago, we got the proof submitted to Starkey Printing. It's in the printing process now. We used a timeline, it's a fold-out timeline, that shows Brian's life highlights across the top of the timeline, and the bottom features significant events that were going on during his lifetime. And he, his life, his, he, I think God brought him to this earth during a very significant time in America's history. Uh, if you look at, for example, he was born a year before the Civil War broke out. Um, during his uh, time, transportation changed dramatically, communication changed dramatically. We shifted from an agricultural economy to a, an industrial economy. We saw a lot of shifts in population. For example, we moved from being prominently rural to uh, more people living in big cities. So all these big things were going on during his lifetime. And he fought for many causes, which the book presents them, and, and you'll see many different significant ways that he uh, helped uh, this huge transition in our country. But the one that, I th that he called his biggest cause for his life was his fight against teaching evolution as a fact. And he, I want to read a quote uh, of his about this particular last battle, if you will, of his life. He said, in this fight, I have the most intolerant and vindictive enemies I have ever met, and I have the largest majority on my side I have ever had, and I am discussing the greatest issue I have ever discussed. So if I could choose only two chapters, if people buy my book and want to pick two chapters to read, I would recommend chapters 14 and 15, because those, my goal in those chapters were to tell why Brian considered this his most significant battle and the greatest issue that he ever discussed. Well, I guess the thing that surprised me most about Brian in, during my research was how ubiqu ubiquitous he was. I mean, he was everywhere during his lifetime and continue, I find things about him uh, today. And I just want to give you some examples. Um, during his lifetime, uh, a newspaper rep reporter pronounced, for example, how significant Brian was during his life as far as being everywhere. Uh, when he commented after Brian's death, he said this. He said that the press should build a memorial for Mr. Brian because he was, he was to the world of news what Babe Ruth is to baseball, the real drawing card. 
And I thought that was a, a good way to describe it. One of the things I had during my research uh, was a subscription to newspapers.com. And a ton of my research was done via newspapers. And he was, he was always on the front page and it was phenomenal. And then of course his ideas today continue to be resurrected. You can do a Google search today with Barack Obama and William Jennings Bryan or, or Donald Trump and William Jennings Bryan, and you'll see how he was referred to and, and talked about during those two recent presidential elections. You can Google tariff reform and William Jennings Bryan, and you'll see it, how he's referenced in discussions today about that topic that's, that is uh, prominent again. So he, he's, he's just ubiquitous in so many ways. So while the book tries to communicate that about him, one of the way, places in the book I really zoomed in, in on it was the part five. And part five is called Brian Remembered. And in that part, you'll see uh, the five homes located in five states that are national historic landmarks to his memory. They are in Illinois, Nebraska, Texas, North Carolina, and Florida. That's pretty widespread. Today, there are four statues that stand in his memory. Of course, we know about the one here in our own town in Dayton, but the other three are in his birthplace town, which is Salem, Illinois, in the place where his, much of his political career was in Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska. And the, the final one is located in um, the U.S. Capitol, and that's a cool one to talk about because in the U.S. Capitol of our nation, there is a collection of 100 statues that make up the National Statuary Hall collection. And to think that, uh, well, every state it submits two statues. And to think that Brian is one of 100 in our U.S. Capitol is a, a pretty cool thought. The, uh, another chapter in that section it talks about the 64 books that are published about Brian since he came on the national scene in 1896. And while those books don't even touch the surface of what was written about Brian in newspapers, scholarly articles, doctoral dissertations, and uh, books that don't even have his title in the name. And I could go on and on, but the final section is what I would say the ultimate memorial to Mr. Bryan, and that, of course, is Bryan College. Uh, and it's interesting to know that when they first planned the, the college in 1925, they were going to call it Bryan Memorial University. And by the time it was chartered five years later, they, called, they named it originally William Jennings Bryan University. And I could go on and tell you many other examples of the ubiquitous nature of Mr. Bryan. Uh, from trips I've been on to uh, do research in Miami and Asheville, North Carolina, uh, and other parts of the country, Lincoln, Nebraska, for example. But I hope that my readers, as they learn about this ubiquitous nature of Mr. Bryan's life, will be inspired to live their lives like, like he did in the same mold that Bryan lived it, uh, and see how God can really use someone mightily who chooses to commit their life to the Lord. There are actually two reasons why that I was inspired to associate the sales of the books so that the proceeds could go to the Bryan Opportunity Scholarship Program. The first kind, the first factor was I wanted to, uh, I was inspired by learning how Bryan loved higher education so much. And he believed and supported it in many ways. For example, um, I emphasized in the book the story of how he loved to connect with students. He, he often spoke on college campuses, his best-selling books targeted young people, his most popular speeches targeted young people. He also uh, was recognized as being the first person to come up with the idea of a university in Miami. He proposed the idea in 1916, and by 1925, Mr. Bryan was one of 15 founding regents of the University of Miami. So, uh, and another cool connection with higher education that Brian had was that by the time he was 40 years old, he had, of course, been all over the country lecturing, and, and he had established at 19 universities and colleges an award, a Brian Prize, he called it, where he would speak at a college and donate his speaker's fee to underwrite a, a, a prize fund. And students would win prizes each year at these universities based upon having written the best paper about free government. So he promoted his ideas that way and also uh, motivated students. He shared in his memoirs one of the reasons he did this was because as a young person, he was very motivated as a student to enter all the contests that came his way. In fact, the prize he won in college for a speech uh, contest he was in, he took those winnings and bought the engagement ring for his wife, Mary. So he, was, he tried to establish that in many schools. 
So, so that's kind of my first reason. Um, I learned through my research how much he loved higher education. And then, of course, my second reason to do so is uh, that I was inspired to look for ways myself to be a, more of a difference maker like Brian was. And uh, when, when I thought about the scholarship and the opportunities that students have had to come here, so far we've had 288 students come to Bryan through that scholarship who otherwise could not have afforded to be here. So it made perfect sense to t bring all of this together, tie it all together and say, hey, any proceeds that come in when this book is sold that, that after we cover the printing costs all go to help more students come to a college that's named in Bryan's memory, that's sending out students who do make a difference in the world like he did. My book project caters to three types of readers. The first level is the person who picks the book up, thumbs through, re looks at some photographs, reads some captions, and sits it down and says, yeah, Brian was a difference maker. A second level is a normal reader who picks a book up and reads it like a normal book and doesn't, doesn't skip too much. And then the third level caters to, through my web companion, which I'd like to talk about now, caters to the third level of reader who wants to dig deeper. Occasionally that happens. And uh, if a student reads a particular chapter, let's say the person, the student is a communications major, and they, they're, the middle of the book has a bunch of stuff about communication. So maybe chapter eight intrigue them and they wanna go to the web companion to look at some additional resources that, that digs more deeply into that aspect of Mr. Bryant so they can learn even more that can help them be more effective in their communication skills. So um, the, the web companion is very much integrated with the book. For example, there are 400 endnotes at the back of the book, and if you eyeball them, you'll see many of them have a capital W and a capital C within the endnote, and that simply means you can go to the web companion to get more information about that particular item that you read in the chapter. Uh, on the back of the book, we have a QR code that, that students can use to take them quickly to the web companion. And of course, when, once they get to the Web Companion, the numbered chapters in the Web Companion, of course, dovetail with what's in the book. So it's pretty easy to find what you're looking for, what you want to do. One, a fun example I want to give you of something that's in the Web Companion that's connected with the book. Chapter 19 is called Name Namesakes and Honors. And there is a discussion in that chapter about all the things, again, the ubiquitous nature of Brian, all the things across the country and within literature and so forth that are uh, tied to him. And in that chapter, I list this opera in, that was written in which William Jennings Bryan is a character. And the funny thing that's in the Web Companion came from Dr. David Luther, who is a, a beloved college professor who is now emeritus, who uh, I have a picture in the Web Companion of, Mr., of Dr. Luther in 1977. He was a doctoral student at Louisiana State University. He played the role of William Jennings Bryan in that opera in New Orleans. And that's just a cool connection of somebody from Bryan being connected with something that is a namesake of his. So that story's in the Web Companion and he tells uh, interesting little side bits about it that, are, that add some color to, his, to the story. And lastly, the last thing I'd like to say about the Web Companion is that it's a dynamic, media-rich, research resource. It's a mouthful, but I'd like that, that web companion to evolve. And therefore, at the bottom of the, of the web companion, I provide a place if somebody wants to submit a resource that they want considered to be added to the web companion, we will grow that research, research resource if uh, people have an interest in doing that. Okay, so I would, I would say that the most important legacy that, that you and I can have, our takeaway that we can have from Brian's legacy, would be this the idea of Christ above all. Uh, he was a perfect role model from Christ, for this idea of Christ above all and how he lived his life. That was the central core of who the man was. And if we can, as we study his life, learn what that internal motivation was for him, because that of course is how our behavior is derived. And as we seek to have that mindset and that heart set of Christ above all, we can also learn about how he communicated and how he interact with other people and how you love people and we see that outward manifestation of what Christ above all looks like and I think we all need help learning and, and being more effective at, at manifesting Christ above all. So I hope as my readers uh, look at this book and, and learn about Mr. Bryan that they'll be inspired uh, to live their life as he did and in one that was uh, 
touch lives in a special way, and we also have that opportunity to do so as well.